spirit of our ancestors, that they might be here like a mighty cloud of witnesses watching over us. Bless now this proceeding with every temporal and special and bless spiritual blessing. And we thank you for the grace that has brought us here tonight in memory of Gilbert Edward Noble, our brother, Gil Noble. Hear our prayer, O God, incline thine ear to us and grant us thy peace. Amen. Amen. Now I'm going to call on Betty Dobson to come now and say a word on behalf of Samotap. I also want her to introduce the drummers who have been come, who are here tonight and say a word about them. So let's put our hands together now for Sister Betty Dobson. Thank you, Reverend Butts. It is wonderful to look out at this audience of people who loved Gil Noble. And you will note that Reverend Butts referred to him as Brother Gil Noble. That is the highest title that you can give a person, to be a person's brother. So it is my delight to be able to address you about a man that I had the greatest admiration for. Here lies a winner. Gil Noble was a winner. Brother Gil Noble set the bar for excellent media entertainment. He set the bar. He raised a successful family, and I was told by Dr. Leonard Jeffries that he even defeated his illness, that Gene was standing next to his bed, and even though this stroke had ravished his body, he picked up her hand and he kissed it to let her know that he loved her. Isn't that remarkable? And she sits here today with her beautiful family, her children, her grandchildren, her, her sisters that she introduced as her oldest sister. And I said she was not the oldest, she was the wisest, and she was the best. And so she agreed with me, didn't you, sister? <laughs> Gil Noble is a winner, brothers and sisters. He left us a legacy that is so powerful that we cannot use it by feeling sad. We've got to follow his instructions. We've got to do something that will continue to make him proud. And he will. He's watching us. And how is he watching us? Do you see his family here? That's Gil Noble. They are watching us. So I say to all of my brothers and sisters and to the family, we are so grateful for the gift of your father, husband, grandfather, uncle, cousin. We are so grateful.
better you didn't say anything about the drummers. Reverend Bless, when you get to be my age, you forget a few things, okay? The uh, Okoku, Nante, Dennis Zulu, you all know who Brother Dennis Zulu was. These are his cubs. And I, I want to say this, Reverend Butt, the young man who is the leader of the drum ensemble, he said to me, he had to work today. But when he was asked to come and drum for this occasion, he said he'd been listening to Gil Noble all of his life. So he said, this drum will have to wait. I've got to be there. So the Okoko Nante drummers are delighted to be here to participate in this wonderful service, this celebration of the life of this great man. Is that enough, Reverend Butts? Okay, thank you. Many of us remember great journalists on TV, men and women who gave us an opportunity to tell our story. Gil Noble, of course, was at the very top of the chart. But there was another who would call on us often, who would invite us to come in, who would give us a half hour, an hour, 15 minutes, whatever he could while he was there. He's on a station, uh, was on a station now known as Fox, Channel 5. But his name is Bill McCreary. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's marvelous seeing the people here showing their appreciation for a great man. And I've known him for a long time. I met him a long, long time ago at a station called WLIB. <laughs> Yes, that's how long ago it's been. I'm not going to take too much of your time, but he was a real person, a real grand person, a person with a heart made of pure gold. I mean, you couldn't tell. You know, he was a newsman, and he had to have a certain look about him, a certain way of doing things. But in here, this is what really, really counted with Gil Noble, my friend, and it was wonderful. A lot of people say, I hear that you gave Gil Noble a job, that you trained Gil Noble. I can't believe that. Believe me, it's true. <laughs> But he was, he was my senior. <laughs> and really, the type of person he was. I think the last time we worked together was in 1967. Yeah, 1967. I left WLIB as the news director. Gil Noble, as a reporter, left also. He went to Channel 7. I went to Channel 5. And that's the last time we really you know, work together. But I've seen him many times after that. We've gone out and we've done things. But say from 1967 to 2005, something was on his mind about our career. I had more or less forgotten about it. It was, you know, something that I did ordinarily. Didn't matter, blah, blah, blah. But in 2005, he wrote me a letter from 1967 to 2005. I couldn't believe it. And this is the character that we're talking about. This is on, like it is paper. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I, and uh, it's dated July 12, 2005. It says, hey man, it's been a long time since I've seen you. Hope you and yours are doing well. This very simply is a long overdue thank you note. This career of mine could not have started without you giving me a temporary job at LIB until Ed Williams returned from the Army to reclaim his job. <laughs> then you decided to keep me on permanently and you let DeWitt Jennings go. I don't know where DeWitt Jennings is today, but I chose <laughs> Gil Noble for the job. He says, at LIB, you taught me how to do rewrites from AP, which was Associated Press, wire copy. In fact, you insisted on me writing every word in my newscast. You taught me how to do beeper interviews, how to edit the audio tapes to be laid into the newscast. All this was happening amidst the civil rights struggle and you sent me all over Harlem chasing those stories. This taught me things about our people that I had never learned in school. It was an inoculation that took. Ironically, it would be the pressure of that struggle that got us out of TV jobs, got us our TV jobs downtown. <laughs> You were an excellent teacher and friend. This is to say thanks for the shove you gave me at the beginning. And the signature is like this. Your buddy, Gil. That's the title. is Gil Noble. That's from here. That's a man. I don't know how many people would have, would have done that after so many years. So that made him. He was just an exceptional person. And with that, I leave you with this. Something that I want and learned from another exceptional person, Alma John. And that is this, if you know, you should teach. If you don't know, then you should learn. That each one should reach one and teach one. Thank you. God. Bill McCreary. Wow. I'd like to call on another. I don't know that I've ever heard him on the radio talking except to being interviewed with his own show, but I've read him so often in the newspaper and his articles. And he's one of the leading commentators on our culture, our history, our politics. And he writes for the Amsterdam News. And his name is Herb Boyd. It's good that I come up at this time, Gene, before they exhaust all the adjectives, you know. <laughs> I don't think one that they won't touch is supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> I never knew exactly what that meant, but it has super at the beginning and audacious seemingly at the end, and it certainly typified who Gil was and what he meant to me. In fact, he made it so difficult for me to get up and down 125th Street. You know, people would recognize me, and I saw you on like it is. And even today, uh, I knew it was going to be a good day because I was going down uh, St. Nicholas Avenue and ran into Les Payne. <laughs> 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 uh, 
And as many of you know, Les was a part of the triumvirate along with Milton Alamadi. And you know, Lisa, we made a number of appearances on the show there too. And a reporter's round table, which I think was absolutely fitting. At least maybe once every two or three months we would be there to kind of sum up things happening in the black world. And that black world well, is extensive. One of my numerologist friend pointed out to me, Gene, that you know, Gil was born on the date, a day after the assassination of Malcolm X, and he made his transition the day after the date of Dr. Martin Luther King. It's very interesting, between those two dates, you have a cavalcade of African-American history and culture that's in those treasured archives, which we should, as Bill Cosby say, we gotta protect those archives. We gotta protect them. There's, there's a couple of people in my life that have been very instrumental in me getting to know Gil and be a part of that family, uh, particularly attorney Robert Van Leerop and Elombe Brath. And <laughs> Calvin, I won't be much longer. I just wanted to note that for me, Gil Noble was global. And whenever he did something like this, you know it was time to go. <laughs> I hope that all of us, I know many of us, I know probably most of us recognize that the people coming before us now are some of our greatest, most talented journalists. These men uh, and uh, women, Yeah, I was thinking a moment ago, Betty Dobson has been, and you know, I don't say this with any disrespect, has been around a long time and uh, has been fighting on behalf of uh, people of African descent for a long time. So the family should know and feel highly honored. And all of the men and women who come up now don't necessarily agree with each other all the time, but they are all committed to the forward advancement of people of African descent. And this has been a wonderful tribute to our brother Gilbert Edward Noble. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Now, is Keisha Williams here? Is Keisha here? All right. So, Eunice, come on. You know, a wake or anything where black folk gather wouldn't be right if there wasn't some good music. So, I'm going to introduce you to somebody that many of you may know already. Her name is Eunice Newkirk. And uh, accompanying her is Mr. Jim Davis, Jr. He's our director of music ministries and fine arts. Gil was a big jazz fan. Yeah. He had his own trio. I didn't know that. He had his own trio. And so uh, I told the family that we'd have him some good music tonight. So let's put your hands together for Mr. Jim Davis, Jr. and Ms. Eunice Luker.
We're trying to make Gil know that we really did like him. We really did appreciate his taste in music, his, his loyalty to his community. He was just a good brother. And I heard, uh, heard Boyd mention coming down St. Nicholas Avenue and he ran into Les Payne, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner, you know, editorial chief for Newsday, founder of the National Association of Black Journalists. Is Les in the house? When I first met Gil, and Gil was a type of man that you remember when you first met him, it was in early 1972. And we were at City College. There was a gathering of what then I think still were called Negro journalists. And uh, I remember meeting them. I was a young whippersnapper reporter from Long Island, and they were all big city New York reporters. And as I met them, I remember precisely, they would say, precisely, I'm Ed Bradley, CBS Radio. I'm Tom Johnson, the New York Times. I'm Ted Poston, the New York Post. Wow. And I'm from Alabama. Oh, <laughs> and I thought that was their last names. It reminded me of, with all respect, how when the slave masters used to go to town, the slaves would dress up in their clothes and wear the plantation. And when I met Gil, he was a tall, unimposing man, and he said, I am Gil Noble, period. <laughs> Gil, Gil was his own man. He was self-assured. He had no subordinates, and he was no one's subordinate. He was well adjusted and he, this is no secret, he related to Malcolm X and he couldn't kowtow. He was interested in the world. He was interested in those days in South Africa he was interested in Zimbabwe. He was interested in what SWAPO was doing. 
in uh, Namibia, Southwest Africa at that point. And we spent many hours together off camera, and it was very instructive to me. And in recent years, I and Herb and Milton Alemani kind of formed a bond, and we would go on his show, and Gil would pull us aside, and he invariably would say, these four topics would always come up. He says, what about Haiti? In that inimitable voice. What are we going to do about Haiti? What about Blackwater? What about black studies? Why are they not teaching it? Why are our children not learning it? How are we going to get them to learn it? And after about the third session, I said, Gil, you're teaching it. I said, Gil, you are preserving it. And he did, and he has, and I'm sure that his work will live on. And I will, since we're at this venue, in this place, on this sad occasion, and I certainly offer my condolences to his widow, Jean. There are five children. There is nothing that can comfort families at times like these. But for the rest of the audience, I would just close with this anecdote. I remember being in this place on a very, very cold, cold evening. And there had been a group of people who had picked the winter to try to get Gil off the air. This is in 1982. <laughs> and people stood up and they came out on that wintry evening. And Gil loved him some Harlem. And it's pretty clear tonight and before it was clear to him that Harlem loved him back. That night, they showed him 30 years ago in this church on a very, very chilly evening when this same Reverend Calvin Otis Butts III read a letter from a man named William Fife. I still remember him. And there had been a lot, I won't get into the gory details, but this was the, what we in the newspaper business call the kicker. There was a large crowd that had gathered, I think downstairs, and they wanted to know what had been the conclusion of this attempt to get Gil off the air and to make sure that he did not deal with international subjects any longer. And Reverend Butts read a letter from Mr. Fife of WABC, and it said essentially that nothing was changed thanks to Harlem that showed Gil that they loved him back. And I remember when they walked out that cold evening, I thought that, you know, I could see in the strides. Uh, now they sat with their jaws tight. But when Reverend Butts finished his letter saying nothing had changed thanks to Harlem, the people walked out and it reminded me of that Leadbelly tune which says, keep your hands off of him. He don't belong to you. I hope the family understands, and I hope all of us understand how powerful this is. 
Um, one of the things that makes it so powerful is many years ago, I can't even remember how long, um, uh, one of my then assistant ministers here named Dino, like Boom, we were trying to get some attention for a rally or something we were having. And Dino said, we need to go to the radio stations. He said, I have some experience with radio stations. And so he said, let's go out to WWRL. He said, there's a fellow out there that I know. His name is Bob Law. And uh, we went out there, and this long, tall guy was sitting behind the desk. He was a lot younger then. Better looking too. He just <laughs> but what we needed, he gave us. And from that point on, I would stay up like many of you, late into the night, early into the morning, listening to night talk and keeping up with what was going on across the country. That was our brother Bob Law. That is our brother Bob Law. And he's here tonight to speak in memory of Gil Noble. Bob Law. Thank you so much. Can y'all hear me? No. I'll move it closer. You can hear me now? It is so gratifying to see all of you who are here as we honor our brother. It is really gratifying. One of the things about Gil Noble, I think it's important that we understand especially back in those early days when taking a position was very risky. And we were all just starting in media. And there were a great many black people who were just so happy to be in the media that they would not risk anything at all. And then there was Gil Noble. You see, Gil Noble understood how important it was that we tell our story. And it wasn't just that we tell our story, but he understood that the rest of the danger was that somebody else would tell it for us. And he heard James Baldwin when Baldwin said that 10 years after his death, a white reporter would say that Miles Davis was a white trumpet player. <laughs> he understood the dangers of somebody else telling our story. And so Gill set out to balance. He used to say that like it is, was all we had as equal time. We had one hour a week on ABC, one hour a week on NBC, and we had one hour on 5, 9, and 11, and I think 13 minutes on CBS. They said that they never did give in. We need to deal with that perhaps even now. But one of the things that was so significant about Gil Noble was that he also gave us voice. There are many of us who were on like it is. And had it not been for Gil Noble, you would not have heard ever from many of the people. See, I think that what's important is that he gave voice to black America. And he didn't attempt to do it all through his voice. But he put people on the air that otherwise would have been ignored. 
And so the telling of our story was enriched by the people that he allowed voice through that medium. And you know, in the entertainment industry, they say that if you get on television, then it's real. People believe it if they see it on television. They don't believe everything they hear me say on the radio, but they believe it if it's on television. And Gil Noble provided that platform, and I think that that's one of the things that was so essential, one of the things that was of great value, that he shared the platform. He was there. And when they would try to take him off the air, we would rally, we would come together to fight because we really felt that Like It Is was our platform. It wasn't just Gil, he made it available to all of us. And let me just say this, let me just say this and then sit down. I want you to be clear, and particularly Gil Noble's family, I want you to be clear. Gil Noble fulfilled his responsibility. Gil Noble, Gil Noble, there's a friend of mine in here, David, David White is in here somewhere. We, we knew a guy who used to say, there he is, he, we knew a guy who used to say, you don't get paid for what you start, you get paid for what you finish. <laughs> Gil Noble finished the job. Gil Noble completed the task. Gil Noble fulfilled his responsibility to our people, to our legacy, to our culture. Gil Noble did a good job. And I say this, and I would just say this to Gil Noble, may the God of our fathers, may the God of our ancestors, may the God of our people welcome you with open arms. Walked into WWRL that evening with Dino. We saw Bob Law, but Bob Law also called another very important brother to us all. In fact, many of us think that he ought to have a show like like it is. He had so many. He had so many, so many powerful expressions. You know, not only his name, but you know the the initials were the Global Black Experience. You know and. And even today, you know, uh, he played such so exotic music that came from the motherland. Even today, when people hear his name, folk just know that they are in for a treat, not only for the mind, for the ear, but also for the heart. He's one of our greatest journalists, one of our most important brothers, one of our outstanding spokesperson, Gary Bird. By way of acknowledgement, let me uh, just say something um, that I, th I think certainly has to be acknowledged immediately. When I was walking uh, down the street coming into the church uh, tonight, uh, some of you who are in here may or may not have heard that there was a sound that was greeting us as we were coming up the street about a block away. And uh, there was an uh, elder sister who was walking near me as we were walking, and she said, well, what is that? And I said, um, it's... Um, probably the drummers for Gil Noble. She said, hmm, drums at church. <laughs> and I think we have to give acknowledgement that sometimes when we go through a very important aspect of recognizing our history, uh, that it was those very drums that were kept from us that are such an important part of who we are today. And Reverend Calvin Bush, the energy that they deserve for acknowledging the power of the drum. Okay? The power of the drum. All right? Okay? All right? That's what that's about. Okay? 
I'm here tonight on behalf of, obviously, my uh, immediate family, uh, my friends, our GBE listenership, and, and our community. There are three areas that I want to address. Uh, they are condolences, uh, congratulations, essentially in celebration, and commitment. On the condolences, which is for us who are gathered here, the family focus. Uh, I have, as have many, we seem to be in terms of 2012 in a year where we are losing a lot of people. Um, and I experienced it leading into the year where I lost someone very close to me. And there is no way to explain when you love someone and they suddenly depart, how you handle the experience that occurs in those days that you go through that moment, that you go to a chair where they used to sit or past a room that they used to be and they're not there. So to this family, uh, in terms of what Brother Bob was saying a moment ago, I want you to really, and it's been said before, but I want you to really understand how much we appreciate you sharing Brother Gill with us. How much we appreciate it. Doing this kind of work is not easy. I tell people, you, you, they saw Gill with one hour, not knowing it could take almost the entire week to put that hour together. And I know because of what I do. I have to do a six hour show on a Sunday and sometimes people are saying to me, hey, it's Saturday, Matep, want to hang out? And I'm like, man, are you kidding? I got 16 hours ahead of me to prepare. I'm not talking about the broadcast. I'm talking about the preparation. So I know what Brother Gill had to address, and I know that as family members, it's a difficult thing to see someone making that kind of commitment week after week and year after year, and we, we appreciate you for it. We truly do. You see, the, the truth is, is that no one but this, uh, this family really knows the true price of Brother Gill's commitment. No one but this family knows the true joy that the work really brought to him or the sacrifices that he made to create what became the broadcast franchise of Like It Is. My experience uh, connection with Gil uh, starts, uh, like most of you perhaps, maybe back when he began to uh, present uh, his television broadcast. Uh, I'm, I'm the youngest of the group that you're hearing here tonight. <laughs> um, and uh, I came here, well, let, let, me, let me clarify that point. I just started uh, or shared my 63rd birthday. <laughs> so. <laughs> Oh, I'm holding it down now. I mean, you know, get it straight. But um, it was a long time ago. But I remember that when I used to turn on the television, Bill McCurry, coming from Buffalo, as I did, where we didn't have a black TV show, that I came to New York, and every channel I turned to had a black show. I said, man, the brothers and sisters got this going in New York City. Oh, man, black TV everywhere you turn. Y'all know that we saw that for what seemed to be a moment. Positively Black, The McCreary Report, Tony Brown's Journal. You remember all these shows. And those shows did not come because they were simply given to us. As Gil often reminded us, they came out of the struggle that we brought to the black experience and to this country. Brother Gill and I uh, had um, in common several things. Uh, one of this, I heard someone mention uh, numerology, so I won't feel so bad to mention astrology. Um, Brother Gill and I were both Pisceans. And uh, that, that delighted me. It delighted me to no end when I found out because I was 19 years old and coming to New York and watching what Gill was doing. And I was on the radio trying to figure out, well, how do I do this on the radio? Maybe I can take John Coltrane and mix him with Malcolm X's voice and create something from there, which I was doing uh, all night long at that time. 
but Pisces people are said to be African people. Interestingly enough, astrologers will tell you that, that African people are Pisces. Uh, hence the love for Africa that you saw from Brother Gill. And I felt that same love. We also had our roots in common uh, stretching back to a black radio at a radio station by the name of WLIB. And I'm telling you, I wanted to be really clear. Bill McCreary doesn't know it. I was talking to Ann Tripp, our news director, and I said, Ann Tripp, I got to call Bill McCreary. I got to get in touch with Bill, not knowing I was going to see him here tonight. But let us be clear that Brother Gil Noble's career, let's honor the TV, but let's acknowledge that his career was born in black radio on WLIB. Okay? Gil and I also had in common our battles to tell the story of our people on the American airwaves. It is not easy. Truly not easy. I don't know what there is about that story that's so powerful, but a lot of folks don't want that story told uh, for some reason. It kind of reminds me of uh, uh, less of, I think, Booker T. Washington said, he said, you know, if one drop of African blood makes you black, that must be one powerful drop. <laughs> I think... The same is true about that issue of history and truth uh, that we saw. And Gil and I had a mutual respect and appreciation for each other's work that, that I think was endless and ultimately uh, revealed itself to me in one situation in which I was having problems with my own radio station and looked up and got a call from Gil. That was the call. When Gil calls you, you know, okay, it's time to make your way down to WABC-TV. And he said, we're going to sit down, we're going to talk about what's going on. And he sat down with me. I thought we'd do a 10-minute segment. We wound up doing an hour segment. And then it seemed like the segment kept going. I lost track of time. And then it turns out that at that particular crucial moment in my career, he actually aired two one-hour specials dealing with my experience and situation back to back to make sure that I had the community support that I needed. That's Brother Gil Noble. I can skip ahead because Brother Bob, when you, when you put Brother Bob Lon on, a pro, on the program, you know, it's, it's pretty much going to be that we share the same thoughts because we, we are brothers uh, for sure. Um, and there are so many people and organizations, I think, today who can tell a story of how Gil helped them, helped their organization, project issue. Black was truly the color of his TV, too. There's no question of that. And his work has been acknowledged. There are the awards, there are all the things that we've seen, and now Gil is an ancestor. Now, y'all know as an ancestor that Brother Gill is up there right now trying to get that Malcolm X interview that he missed. <laughs> Y'all know that. <laughs> Y'all know that, right? That's the first interview. <laughs> That's the first one. <laughs> okay? Don't be surprised if you see a beam coming down in your radio or something like, here's that interview with Gil. Um, but isn't it fascinating when you see how God creates destiny? He was a noble man. His name was Gil Noble, but he was a noble man. I say he was a champion of our people who, as Bob said, essentially was never afraid to take a stand. And I think that today, for us, there are many lessons that we can learn uh, from Brother Gil, but perhaps None more important than the issue of commitment, which I mentioned earlier as the last piece, as we engage in what is essentially a congratulations and a celebration. And the congratulations is for truly a life and career well lived. Well lived. And a brother who brought a commitment that ultimately we can now see, it's fascinating to realize this, but it turned out to be a lifetime commitment to us. And so now we are in the position to make a commitment to him and to his family and to the process for our community, our people, and ultimately for humanity. What am I talking about? Gil had his concerns about his legacy, mine as well and others who were in this field of communications. Some of you have listened to the interview that I did with Gil in 2006 will hear Gil outline and detail those concerns specifically. The Gil Noble Archives is what I am pointing towards right now. The Gil Noble Archives. 
Now, I know that you've heard, you've probably heard me say it a hundred times, you're going to hear me say it a thousand times. The Gill Noble Archives, Post Office Box 43138, Upper Montclair, New Jersey, dedicated to the preservation and digitization of his invaluable Like It Is library. Do y'all hear me? Hear me? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, I have a dream. I have a dream. I, I can see the Gil Noble Awards for Community and Broadcast Excellence, the Noble Awards. And I can see myself standing on the stage saying, and the Noble goes to Bo McCreary. I see that. I can see it. Okay? I see it. Clear. The Gil Noble Scholarship Awards. The Gil Noble School of Broadcasting. Don't get me started with my branding. Don't get me started with my ideas. I'm a Pisces. I'm creative. Okay? This is an opportunity for us to show what we have learned from Gil over these years. Let's show him what we learned. One program. If they destroy the... They better not. But if they destroyed the entire Gil Noble Library, there would be one program that we would have to fight to the last man and woman to make sure they could not destroy. And the irony is that it links right to where we stand in this moment. I'm talking about the Reverend Congressman Adam Clayton Powell and the program. When you leave this church tonight, when we move to this next phase of consciousness and this next phase of reality, brothers and sisters, let's show Brother Gil Noble that we learned the lesson. Let's show him what's in our hands, like it is. And they have a beautiful uh, presentation from the Jamaica Progressive League Incorporated. A tribute to Gil Noble. May his soul rest in peace. And we also have two beautiful proclamations entered into the halls of Congress by the Honorable Congressman Charles B. Rangel. <laughs> friends. I feel like I'm the luckiest musician in New York because I am amongst friends and I have so many friends who have traveled this journey oops, with me in the media. It's good to have friends in the media. I'm going to play something for Brother Jim, but I'd like to say a few words. When I first came to New York in 1971, I came here with little more than my faith, my flute, and $400. And I met so many of these illustrious people, particularly Gil Noble, who invited me on like it is. I'd like to thank the family for sharing them with us. And I'm just going to say a couple of adjectives that come to mind. In my opinion, Gil Noble was a global griot. He was a willing warrior. Gil Noble mattered. He was consistent. Gil Noble remains relevant. There is a certain pleasure in life when you come to this plane and recognize your assignment. Gil Noble recognized his assignment, and he did it quite well. This brother chose not to acquiesce. He chose not to arabesque. I'm a country girl living in the big city, and I remain that. 
I love this city because of people like Gil Noble. 40 years. One thing that my mother said, and she had a fourth grade education, but the smartest person I ever knew, she said, you know what, if you tell the truth the first time, it's not too much you gotta remember. I would like to say that Gil Noble signed off with pride. And you know why? What I got from the subject was that he, in his teachings, was to advocate, then modulate. Amazing grace. <laughs> Let me say that, of course, the final tribute of respect for our brother Gilbert Edward Noble will be tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. You will see many people like Councilman Charles Barron, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, and some others who will be speaking tomorrow. They will not be speaking this evening, so don't think that we've overlooked them. And there are many of you in here I know who have a lot to say and could probably keep us here for the rest of the evening, but we're gonna let the family go home soon. But I want to invite just a few more very quickly. One is a brother who worked at Hofstra University on Long Island. This brother had a program that took young men and women, African descent, and Latino, by the way, and trained them so that they might not only succeed in college, but graduate with exceptional excellence and go on to become leaders in their community. I know about this program because I was invited to speak once. And I said, wow, how did I get invited? 
He said, Gil Noble couldn't come. <laughs> but what I discovered was that Gil Noble had been coming and continued to come after that for over 25 years. He did it unassumingly. He did it without a lot of fanfare. But this brother Carl, Frank, are you here? Where? Here he is. This is Dr. Frank Smith from the new program at Hofstra University. And we're inviting to the mic now. Uh, good evening, brothers and sisters. Can you hear me now? Okay, good evening, brothers and sisters. You know, as Reverend Butt said, Gil Noble had been coming to Hofstra University for over 25 years. And what he didn't say is that Gil Noble came at least three times a year for those 25 years, without pay, without any fanfare, without any anything. He came once during my summer orientation. He came once to talk to my freshman students. He came once a year during Black History, Black History Month. And I established a very, very close relationship with, 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 with Brother Gil Noble. And so consequently, I, with, with, with great urging, with, 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 with great uh, compassion, I urged the university to give Brother Noble an honorary degree. And it took a lot of fighting. It took a lot of uh, uh, maneuvering. It took a lot of preparation, but ultimately the university did agree to give Brother Gil Noble an honorary degree. I, I really have two things to say. Every time I would see Brother Noble, he always would, would leave me with these words, go out and do some damage to injustice. <laughs> He always left me with those words, go out and do some damage to injustice. And then one of the other things Brother Noble would say to me is that he, he often quoted Dr. Martin Luther King. He said that Dr. King said that the hottest place in hell is reserved to the innocent bystanders of injustice. And those two things will stay with me for the rest of my life. On my last occasion of seeing Brother Gil Noble, let me tell you a little brief story. This is what he told me. He told me a story about uh, Frederick Douglass in the, in the 19th century. And Frederick Douglass had just come from giving a lecture. As you know, Frederick Douglass was a great lecturer. He had just come from giving some great address. And while he was being escorted home, a young black reporter was with him. And at that time, Brother Frederick Douglass was, was stricken with a stroke. And, and, and kind of realizing that this was the stroke of all strokes, this was the stroke that was going to take him out of here, Frederick Douglass urged him to take him up to his room. And this young reporter traveled with him to his room. And what he said, he said, look, Frederick Douglass, what can you say to me, a young man, a young reporter, Tell me what I ultimately need to do with my life. Say, say something wise, say something to me that will drive my life forward. And Frederick Douglass just turned, Brother Noble told me. He tossed and he turned, he said three words to, the, to this young brother. And those three words were, and those three words uh, exemplified to me what Brother Noble was trying to tell me, what Brother Noble wanted me to do, and what I think Brother Noble wanted all of us to do. The three words that Frederick Douglass had, he said, look, agitate, agitate, agitate. And, 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 and so, I really do think for all my students, hundreds and thousands of students at Hofstra University, for all of us who are assembled here today, that the greatest testimony we can give to this brother who we loved is to agitate. Is to agitate. Is to agitate. I love you, Brother Gill. I love you, Brother Gill. I love the family. And thank you very much for allowing me to make this brief remark.
is Dr. Dr. Joy, uh, the great dog, there she is. Come on, sister. couldn't get over it. So then we invited her to the church. And she came to the church and we ain't got over it since. This is one of the most powerful, thoughtful, dynamic sisters in the universe. I want to first um, offer my condolences to the family. Um, I, I am so pleased to have this moment to actually see you because for whatever applause I got, Gil Noble made me. Okay, he ma I stood on his shoulders, so I really appreciate that. I actually um, am new to the family and you know, when Gil Noble tells you that he wants you to do something, you just do it. And I often got that phone call. With the first phone call I got from Gil Noble, I had given a talk in Barbados, a UN conference on race, and uh, it, it created a few problems, that particular conference. Um, and Gil Noble called me. I didn't know who he was because I was in Portland, Oregon. That's my fault. And when Gil called me, I didn't know who he was, and I was so used to dealing with black people that aren't black. Are you following me? They often are put in special positions, those people. So I didn't know who he was. He said, I want, I'd like to talk to you about that. And I was very suspicious because I didn't know who Gil Noble was. But when I got uh, to New York and, and felt the love, uh, my life took off in another direction. My whole life took off. I had, you know, written post-traumatic because I wanted it to get to the people on the ground first. That's why I wanted it to get to us. I didn't want it to come from somewhere else. And Gil Noble made certain that happened. He brought me on over and over again. I kept, I got started getting scared because you know how black people are. Why is she on again? What's she, she doing here again, right? But what Gil would do is an issue would happen. He said, you need to come and talk about what we need to learn from the continent. He says, talk to us about what Africa would give to us around this. And I want you to know that Gil Noble would have called me and everyone else around Trayvon. Let's be clear. He'd have made that call. So I'm really clear about the, sh the shoulders I stand on. And I think more importantly, what Gil Noble did is he handed me the baton. You see, he handed me the baton. I'm, I'm 54 years old, but he handed it to me and, and said, don't drop it, Joy. You make certain you hand it off, and I have that debt to pay. I am going to pass the baton on to others. But I want to end with... Um, an incredible story that I told Gil, and it, it brings me back to this, to this moment right here. Because see, Gil believed in me before I believed in me. And so he kept pushing me and saying, our people need you. You have work to do. You know, but it was scary for me because I had to step away from the university to write the book, to do what I needed to do. I had to step away, and there wasn't nothing to step off into except faith. So I stepped out on faith and said, I just figured God going to hold me on this one. But I got scared. I still got scared. And every now and then I'd hear my mother who passed away, she would say, girl, that's a good job. You know, don't, you know. <laughs> I'm giving up. It's a good job, right? And then I think to myself, maybe I could put it off for a couple years and, you know, try to get tenure and all that sort of thing. And then one day I was in a... I was in a, actually I was in a church, I think I was in Chicago, and I, no, actually I was at the University of Chicago, and there was a, a public meeting, and this elder came in, and I saw her in the back of the room. She was on a walker. She was blue-black, blue-black. 
And she had that, you know, that, that, that blue haze around your eyes. You know what I'm talking about. She was an elder. And I, was, I had just come off the stage and had made, basically decided to, you know, kind of put things off for a while. And she, I saw her trying to make her way to me. She had two younger folks on either side. They looked like great, great grands. And every time they would try to help her, she would yank her arm away and just start making away, and she would labor, breathe, you know, labor with each step. And I told her from the side, I said, please don't take another step, I will come to you. And so everyone parted and allowed me to, to go to this elder. And it took her a long time, but, and I waited there patiently, and her two great-grands were very, very reverently standing beside her, and she finally reached her hand out to me with the gnarled hand knuckles, that smooth black leather skin. And she reached out her hand to me and I put my hand in hers and she held them and she leaned in and she smiled at me. And she said to me, I have waited for you my whole life. None of can die. I'm gonna pass this baton. Brother Shanga, where is he? Come up, Brother Shanga. Brother Shanga owned the Rocket Shack on 125th Street. Before I say anything, I'd like to pass my condolences to my brother's family. I walked with Gil. We talked. We tried to heal each other from the wounds that we have incurred through the years in these streets here. And he was passionate about it, especially about Harlem and Africa. Gil is a soldier who fought in the battlefield. Maybe independence of Namibia and South Africa wouldn't be here by now if we didn't have a Gil Noble. He stood tall when everybody was hiding behind the pillars. He stood tall for everybody who was about something. And we admire that brother. And he was more than a brother to me. From the day we met, I known Gil for over 40 years when he was working with uh, Brother McCrary at WLIB. And we walked a long way. And it is something to remember that some of the strongest warriors we have they are born in this soil here. Yeah. Harlem has contributed so much to Africa. <laughs> we nurtured here in Harlem. We found unity in Harlem. Many of our leaders 
who came early. They walked the streets of Harlem. Kwame Nkrumah walked the streets here. And he sold fish to further his education right here in Harlem. I could never forget Harlem. I could never forget a Gil Noble who had so much love for Harlem. Some of us don't have no idea the contribution of one because we just see them on television, but the passion inside that man is unsurpassed. And again, I thank you, Brother Gil Noble. Williams get here. Keisha not here. All right. Eunice. <laughs> we don't have far to go now. Then we're gonna let the family go, and then we'll have one final tribute to Gil Noble. Come on, Eunice.
first of all, it is a great honor for a brother from a steel town called Youngstown, Ohio, by way to the coal fields of West Virginia, to have an opportunity to share a few words this evening. And I say that because I am from out in Youngstown, Ohio. I've been here about 17 years. That does not qualify me for being a New Yorker. <laughs> and I say that because in Youngstown, Ohio, we knew about Gil Noble. Gil Noble in the movement throughout the years back in the day was known throughout the country and throughout the world. You knew when you came to New York, if you wanted to be somebody, you had to be on like it is. So I wanted to be somebody, so I came to, to be on like it is to be with Gil Noble. First and foremost, I want to just say to the family, it is, I've been thinking about this all day, what, what a marvelous, what a marvelous phenomenon to, to have produced and shared such an incredible human being that contributed so much to so many people. And so though it is an hour of sadness, it's also an hour of great celebration because he has left so much. And as so many have said, we thank you so much for having shared Gil with us. We thank you so much for sharing Gil with us. So much has been said, so much has been said, and I, when I was thinking about Gil, it's just, it's also the question of the humanity. Because sometimes, you know, you're in the movement, Last, you know, people, you know, they people, you know, everybody hard, Charles, you know, you know, tough and, but not with Gil. Smile, I mean, this big smile. Gracious, generous, humble. I mean, just one of the brothers, you know, and just one of, just one of us out in the community. So this incredible human being who had so much to give to us, and yet he had all of these marvelous tra traits, courteous, kind, and committed. But I also want to say, however, and this has been captured is, and I use the phrase of my dear beloved brother, Dr. James Turner, and I talk about this so much. And this has been reflected. He was of the race, and he was for the race. We have a lot of people, and Sister Joy referred to this, we have a lot of people out here who are of the race. That is to say, they look like us. And particularly today when we have people in high places. You know, we have people in the world in corporate America and all around. You know, we have people who look like us. And as Charles often says, they are cosmetically black but not authentically black. <laughs> but Gil Noble, and this is important, this, this does not mean that he was opposed to anybody, but he was of the race and for the race. And that's important because even today we need more people who will stand in Gil Noble's shoes and be of the race and for the race. He knew why he was at like it is. Right. We got a lot of people today in all these positions and we're struggling, we're in a state of emergency and it's almost like the new black on black crime is black people who block progress because they don't understand why they're there. The movement was putting people in position and you heard about how Gil learned. He learned from Malcolm, he learned from Brother McCary, he learned, but he learned it well. He understood that his mission in life therefore was to be among people in Harlem and throughout the world, but to deliver on the promise of being of the race and for the race. To liberate us with information and knowledge and to archive it so that it would be there for us as we move forward in this arduous struggle that is yet to be completed in this hostile land that we have landed on as Africans in America. And so I say this is an incredible legacy. And Emotep and others have spoken to this. That we need to understand that he acquitted his responsibility, but there's now a heavy legacy as we now see what is unfolding. So many, we're on, in retreat. We can celebrate what we've accomplished, but we're in, in retreat in so many fields. It's time really to mobilize and organize again to be on the offensive. Gil Noble would have us be on the offensive. He would have us be on the offensive. And so I don't want to stir up any trouble. I really don't. But I just want to say that there is a tradition here that we need to uphold. And uh, here and now just ain't like it is.
you have to recognize the whole family and you'll be back in the morning that Gil Noble was no slouch he was one of the most powerful and respected journalists that our community has known is going to come now and recite a poem that he wrote for Brother Gill. Listen. Listen. Then we're going to come back. Now, when we come back, one last person will speak. I'm going to tell you who it is. I got a note that says, so many great people speaking, but no young people. So there's a young woman in our church. Her name is Dr. Ebony Marshall Terman. Listen. Listen. So I'm going to let her say the last word, give us a closing prayer, and then we will go into the night. And so we'll go having celebrated the life of Gil Noble and having given the family, hopefully, the blessing of Harlem. Amen. You know Gil is happy. You know he's proud. Give yourselves a hand. For those of you who never had the opportunity to meet him, I, I wish you did. He was a very special human being. We use that word, we use a lot of words, but some people personify these words beyond the definition that you'll find in the dictionary. So I'm going to just do this poem because, like a good friend of mine said, that sounded like it just came to you, and it did. Gil was a friend. I do have one story I remember. We hadn't seen each other for a minute. And we had a Sonia Sanchez poetry reading, and we were talking to ourselves. We were trying to be cool, you know? And uh, Sonia said, I hate when brothers are talking, and our sisters get ready to read her poetry. <laughs> Man, Gil and I became two inches tall. We felt so bad, but we laughed about it later because we knew we were out of order, but we were just happy to see each other. See. Like Brother Imhotep, he's a Pisces. I'm a Pisces, too. He <laughs> was on the 22nd of February, and I'm the 25th of February. That's a monster week, boy, I swear. <laughs> anyway, for Brother Gil Noble, his name said it all. Noble was he in everything he did. He told it like it was in a noble way. Never crude or rude. Never heard him raise his voice. He made the wiser choice. Sp 
spoke about the pain and the shame of Africans here and abroad. He exposed the truth and he exposed the fraud. Oh, how noble he was. A tall, cinnamon brown brother with a voice as soothing as a mother. Tell a story to a child about a world gone wild. He was the elegance of style. Noble was his walk, noble was his talk. Could tickle the ivory too. Playing jazz was another thing he could do. The TV grill, telling it like it is. No force, no fizz. He painted a picture of the way it really is. This noble man was a friend of mine, and I'm sure he was one of a kind. Nobility and stability is what he meant to me. I will miss him dearly, but I know his soul is free. Well, I've read that I sit somewhere between the hip hop generation and Generation X. And so I guess I will speak on behalf of those who are identified as young people tonight. Um, I met uh, Brother Gil Noble when I was just a little girl. I happened to turn on the TV one Sunday morning. We went to early service, Pastor. Um, <laughs> I happened to turn on the TV uh, on a Sunday morning, I'm guessing, as, as a young girl. And I saw this black man telling it like it is. I remember the color. And I remember seeing black people who were serious black people who were bold and outrageous, black people who were courageous and who were speaking truth in a troubled world. And it was, uh, you know, catching Gil Noble uh, from time to time that I would hear his spirit and feel his spirit and those who he would speak with and be called into perhaps even my own destiny. The other experience that I had with Gil Noble came um, also secondhand. I used to dance with a company um, uh, here in New York City, Alvin Ailey, and Judith Jemison told me uh, a while ago, she said, Gil Noble is sick. And I just remember him from afar. I remember that she would speak about him all the time and his love for black art and culture. And so I guess what I can say is what the elders have done has not been done in vain. That there are those of us, Generation Xers, those of us who count ourselves amongst the hip hop generation even, who heard what you all were saying, who continue to hear what it is that you have to say, and who also are in tune with what the ancestors speak to us from the other side. And so you may hear kids nowadays exclaiming, I'm just saying. But believe it or not, in the spirit of our father, 
our fathers and our mothers, we still will tell it like it is. And so to the family, I offer, I offer my deepest condolences for the loss of your father and your husband, your loved one. But I want you to know that his spirit lives on in all of us. So God bless you. I ask that we all stand as we prepare to receive our closing prayer. Eternal God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in this house of prayer. We thank you, God, for the gift of Gil Noble. We thank you, O oh God, that he thought it not robbery to speak. And we know that you, your word says that the words of our mouths must be acceptable in your sight. We ask, God, that you would be merciful to our brother and that you would hold him in your bosom for all eternity. As we depart from this place, but never from your presence, let us carry his spirit with us. Let us love each other. Let us celebrate each other and celebrate this gift of life. We thank you, O oh God, and we offer this prayer in the name of your son, in the name of the spirit, and in the name of all the ancestors who rest with you. Amen. Amen.